Section 9 of the Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 9 Womanhood. It should be the highest ambition of every young woman to possess a true womanhood. Earth presents no higher object of attainment. To be a woman is the truest and best thing beneath the skies. A true woman exists independent of outward adornments. It is not wealth or beauty of person or connection or station or power of mind or literary attainments or variety and richness of outward accomplishments that make the woman these often adorn womanhood as the ivy adorns the oak but they should never be mistaken for the thing they adorn the great error of womankind is that they take the shadow for the substance the glitter for the gold the heraldry and trappings of the world for the priceless essence of womanly worth which exists within the mind every young man as a general rule has some purpose laid down for the grand object of his life some plan for the accomplishment of all which all his other actions are made to serve as auxiliaries it is to be regretted that every young woman does not also have a set purpose of life some grand aim grand in its character she should in the first place know what she is what power she possesses what influences are to go out from her what position in life she was designed to fill what duties are resting upon her what she is capable of being what fields of profit and pleasure are open to her how much joy and pleasure she may find in a true life of womanly activity when she has duly considered these things she should then form the high purpose of being a true woman and make every circumstance bend to her will for the accomplishment of this noble purpose there can be no higher aim to set before herself there is no nobler attainment this side of the spirit land than lofty womanhood there is no ambition more pure than that which craves this crown for her mortal brow to be a genuine woman full of womanly instincts and power forming the intuitive genius of her penetrative soul the subduing authority of her gentle yet resolute will is to be a peer of earth's highest intelligence all young women have this noble prize before them they may all put on the glorious crown of womanhood they may make their lives grand in womanly virtues a true woman has a power something peculiarly her own in her moral influence which when duly developed makes her queen over a wide realm of spirit but this she can possess only as her powers are cultivated it is cultivated woman that wield the sceptre of authority among men wherever cultivated woman dwells there is refinement intellect moral power life in its highest form to be a cultivated woman she must commence early and make this the grand aim of her life whether she work or play travel or remain at home converse with friends or study books gaze at flowers or toil in the kitchen visit the pleasure party or the sanctuary of god she keeps this object before her mind and taxes all her powers for its attainment every young woman should also determine to do something for the honor and elevation of her sex her powers of mind and body should be applied to a good end let her resolve to help with the weight of her encouragement and counsel her sisters who are striving nobly to be useful to remove as far as possible the obstacles in their way 
let her call to her aid all the forces of character she can command to enable her to persist in being a woman of the true stamp in every class of society the young women should awaken to their duty they have a great work to do it is not enough that they should be what their mothers were they must be more the spirit of the times calls on women for a higher order of character and life will they heed the call will they emancipate themselves from the fetters of custom and fashion and come up a glorious company to the possession of a vigorous virtuous noble womanhood that shall shed new light upon the world and point the way to a divine life woman's influence is the chief anchor of society and this influence is purifying the world and the work she has already accomplished will last forever no costly marble can build a more enduring monument to her memory than the impress she makes on her own household the changing scenes of life may hurl the genius of man from eminence to utter ruin for his life hangs on the fabric of public opinion but the honest form of a true mother reigns queen in the hearts of her children forever man's admirers may be greater but woman holds her kindred by a silken cord of familiar kindness strengthened and extended by each little courtesy of a lifetime man may make his monument of granite or of marble woman hers of immortality man may enjoy here she will enjoy hereafter man may move the rough crowd by his eloquence woman will turn his coarseness into a cheerful life man may make laws and control legislatures woman will mould their minds in the schoolroom and be the author of their grandest achievements cruelty she despises and it lessens at her bidding purity she admires and it grows in her presence music she loves and her home is full of its melody happiness is her herald and she infuses a world with a desire for enjoyment without her cabins would be fit for dwellings furs fit for clothing and all the arts and improvements would be wanting in stimulus and ambition for the world is moved and civilization is advanced by the silent influence of woman this influence is due not exclusively to the fascination of her charms but to the strength uniformity and consistency of her virtues maintained under so many sacrifices and with so much fortitude and heroism without these endowments and qualifications external attractions are nothing but with them their power is irresistible beauty and virtue are the crowning attributes bestowed by nature upon woman and the bounty of heaven more than compensates for the injustice of man the possession of these advantages secures to her universally that degree of homage and consideration which renders her independent of the effect of unequal and arbitrary laws but it is not the incense of idol worship which is most acceptable to the heart of woman it is the courtesy and just appreciation of her proper position merit and character woman surpasses man in the quickness of her perception and in the right direction of her sympathies and thus it is justly due to her praise that the credit of her acknowledged ascendancy is personal amidst the increasing degeneracy of man woman is the conservator of morality and religion her moral worth holds man in some restraint and preserves his ways from becoming inhumanly corrupt mighty is the power of woman in this respect every virtue in woman has its influence on the world a brother husband friend or son is touched by its sunshine its mild beneficence is not lost a virtuous woman in the seclusion of her home 
breathing the sweet influence of virtue into the hearts and lives of its loved ones is an evangel of goodness to the world she is a pillar of the external kingdom of right she is a star shining in the moral firmament she is a priestess administering at the fountain of life every prayer she breathes is answered in a greater or less degree in the hearts and lives of those she loves her heart is an altar fire where religion acquires strength to go out on its mission of mercy we cannot overestimate the strength and power of a woman's moral and religious character the world would go to ruin without her with all our ministers and churches and bibles and sermons man would be a prodigal without the restraint of woman's virtue and the consecration of her religion woman first lays her hand on our young faces she plants the first seeds she makes the first impressions and all along through life she scatters the good seeds of her kindness and sprinkles them with the dews of her piety a woman of true intelligence is a blessing at home in her circle of friends and in society wherever she goes she carries with her a health-giving influence there is a beautiful harmony about her character that at once inspires a respect which soon warms into love the influence of such a woman upon society is of the most salutary kind she strengthens right principles in the virtuous incites the selfish and indifferent to good actions and gives to the light and frivolous a taste after something more substantial than the frothy gossip with which they seek to recreate themselves many a woman does the work of her life without being noticed or seen by the world the world sees a family reared to virtue one child after another growing into christian manhood or womanhood and at last it sees them gathered around the grave where the mother that bore them rests from her labors but the world has never seen the quiet woman laboring for her children making their clothes providing them food teaching them their prayers and making their homes comfortable and happy a woman's happiness flows to her from sources and through channels different from those that give origin and conduct to the happiness of man and in a measure will continue to do so forever her faculties bend their exercise toward different issues her social and spiritual notions demand a different element her powers are eminently practical she has a rich store of practical good sense an ample fund of tact skill shrewdness inventiveness and management it is her work to form the young mind to give it direction and instruction to develop its love for the good and true it is her work to make home happy to nourish all the virtues and instill all the sweetness which builds men up into good citizens she is the consoler of the world attending it in sickness her society soothes the world after its toils and rewards it for its perplexities they receive the infant when it enters upon its existence and drape the cold form of the aged when life is past they assuage the sorrows of childhood and minister to the poor and distressed loveliness of spirit is woman's sceptre and sword for it is both the emblem and the instrument of her conquest her influence flows from her sensibilities her gentleness and her tenderness it is this which disarms prejudice and awakens confidence and affection in all who come within her sphere which makes her more powerful to accomplish what her will has resolved than if nature had endowed her with the strength of a giant as a wife and mother woman is seen in her most sacred and dignified aspect as such she has great influence over the characters of individuals over the condition of families and over the destinies of empires 
how transitory are the days of girlhood the time when the cheerful smile the merry laugh and the exulting voice were so many expressions of happiness how quickly it passed how time has multiplied its scores and accumulated its unwelcome effects against the charms and attractions of youth but if the heart be chilled if the cheek be more pale and the eye less bright if the outward adornment of the temple of love have become faded and dimmed there may yet be inwardly preserved the shrine where is laid up the sacred treasures of loveliness and purity gentleness and grace the attempered qualities of tried and perfected virtues as if the blossoms of early childhood had ripened into the mellow and precious fruits of autumnal time but in another and better sense a good woman never grows old years may pass over her head but if benevolence and virtue dwell in her heart she is as cheerful as when the spring of life first opened to her view when we look at a good woman we never think of her age she looks as happy as when the rose first bloomed on her cheek in her neighborhood she is a friend and benefactor in the church the devout worshipper and exemplary christian who does not love and respect the woman who has spent her days in acts of kindness and mercy who has been the friend of sorrowing ones whose life has been a scene of kindness and love devotion to truth and religion such a woman cannot grow old she will always be fresh and beautiful in her spirits and active in her humble deeds of mercy and benevolence if the young lady desires to retain the bloom and beauty of youth let her not yield to the way of fashion and folly let her love truth and virtue and to the close of her life will she retain those feelings which now make life appear a garden of sweets ever fresh and green End of section nine section ten the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by brian efron the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section ten home harmonies can there be a more important theme to claim the attention of thinking parents than that of home harmonies how to make the home life so pleasant and full of kindly courtesy that its members will look to it as the pleasantest spot on earth and find their highest enjoyment in advancing the innocent pleasures of home is it not the duty of parents to make their homes as pleasant as they possibly can for their children and their mates should they not strive to have them resound with the fun and frolic of childhood and enlivened with the cheerfulness of happy social life for too many homes are like the frame of a harp that stands without strings in form and outline they suggest music but no melody arises from the empty spaces and thus it happens that home is unattractive dreary and dull and do you fathers and mothers you who have sons and daughters growing up around you do you ever think of your responsibility of keeping alive the home feeling in the hearts of your children remember that within your means the obligation rests upon you of making their homes the pleasantest spot on earth to make the word home to them the synonym of happiness go to as great length as you consistently can to provide for them those amusements which if not provided there entice them elsewhere you had better spend your money thus than in ostentation and luxury and far better than to amass a fortune for your children to spend in the future the richest legacy you can leave your child is a lifelong inextinguishable and fragrant recollection of home when time and death have forever dissolved the enchantment give him that and on the strength of that will he make his way in the world but let his recollection of home be repulsive 
and the fortune you may leave him will be a poor compensation for the loss of that tenderness of heart and purity of life which not only a pleasant home but the memory of one would have secured remember also that while they will feel grateful to you for the money you may leave them and will think of you when gone they will go to your green graves and bless your very ashes for that sanctuary of quiet comfort and refinement to which you may if you possess the means transform your home the memory of the beautiful and happy homes of childhood will in after years come to the weary mind like strains of low sweet music and in its silent influence for good will prove of infinite more value than houses stocks and money too frequently the effect of prosperity is to render the heart cold and selfish but the heart will never forget the hallowed influence of happy home memories it will be an evening enjoyment to which the lapse of years will only add new sweetness such a home memory is a constant inspiration for good and as constant a restraint from evil a constant endeavor should be made to render every home cheerful innocent joy should reign in every heart there should be found domestic amusements fireside pleasures quiet and simple they may be but such as shall make home happy and not leave it that irksome place that will oblige the youthful spirit to look elsewhere for joy there are a thousand unobtrusive ways in which we may add to the cheerfulness of home the very modulations of the voice will often make a wonderful difference how many shades of feeling are expressed by the voice what a change comes over us by a change of tones no delicately tuned harp string can awaken more pleasures no grating discord can pierce with more pain it is practicable to make home so delightful that children shall have no disposition to wander from it or prefer any other place it is possible to make it so attractive that it shall not only firmly hold its own loved ones but shall draw others into its cheerful circle let the house all day long be the scene of pleasant looks pleasant words kind and affectionate acts let the table be the happy eating place of a merry group and not simply a dull board where the members come to eat let the sitting-room at evening be the place where a merry company settle themselves to books and games till the round of good-night kisses are in order let there be some music in the household not kept to show to company but music in which all can join let the young companions be welcomed and made for the time a part of the group in a word let the home be surrounded by an air of cozy and cheerful goodwill then children will not be exhorted to love it you will not be able to tempt them away from it to the man of business home should be an earthly paradise to the embellishment of which his leisure time and thoughts might well be devoted life is certainly a pleasanter thing if the inevitable daily drudgery be relieved by a little lightness brightness and intelligent enjoyment the craving for amusement is a natural one and within proper bounds it ought to be gratified and there is surely no better entertainment for the spare hours of an intelligent man than the embellishment of his home so that it will be an agreeable place for himself and his family to dwell in and for his friends to visit he may be assured that his children as they grow up will become better men and women and more useful members of society if they live in a home which is itself a work of art and in which they are surrounded by objects stimulative to the intellect the imagination and to all the better feelings of their natures this making home a work of art is not a piece of sentimentalism but it is one which ought to address itself in the strongest manner to the minds of all practical people there is nothing better worthy of adornment than the house we live in and a home arranged and fitted up with taste will be better cared for it will beget habits of greater neatness it will inspire nobler thoughts it will exert a pleasanter influence not only on its inmates but on the whole neighborhood than one fitted with the costliest objects selected with indiscrimination without plan and merely for the purpose of ostentatious display it has been said that there is sure to be contentment in a home in the windows of which can be seen birds and flowers and it may also be said that there will be the same conditions wherever there are pictures on the walls a room without pictures is like a room without windows pictures are loopholes of escape to the soul leading to other scenes and other spheres they are consolers of loneliness they are books they are histories and sermons which we can read without turning over the leaves the sweet influence of flowers is no less than that of paintings at all seasons of the year they are gladly welcomed 
They are emblematic of both the joys and sorrows of life, and religion has associated them with the highest spiritual verities. Faded though they may sometimes be, they have the power to wake the cords of memory and make us children again. At the sickbed and marriage feast, on altar and cathedral walls, they have a meaning, and the humblest home looks brighter where they bloom. Many a child goes astray, not because there is a want of prayers or virtue at home, but simply because home lacks sunshine. A child needs smiles as much as flowers, sunbeams. Children look little beyond the present moment. If a thing pleases them, they are apt to seek it. If it displeases, they are prone to avoid it. Children are great imitators and are never so happy as when trying to do what they see other people do. Their plays consist in copying actual affairs of the older ones, and these amusements often really prepare the children for the actual business of life so that they may sooner become helpful to their parents. They should be watched and encouraged, therefore, in their plays to habits of thoughtfulness and self-reliance. It is to be hoped that games of skill, which shall try the wit and patience of both parents and children, will become the fashion of the times until every home in the land shall be supplied with these accessories of pleasure, until every child shall have in his father's house, be it humble or costly, such appliances and helps for his entertainment, that he shall find his amusements under his father's roof and in his father's presence. Among home amusements, the best is the good old habit of conversation, the talking over the events of the day in bright and quick play of wit and fancy. The story which brings the laugh and the speaking the good, kind, and true things which all have in their hearts. Conversation is the sunshine of the mind, an intellectual orchestra where all the instruments should bear a part. Cultivate singing in the family. The songs and hymns your childhood sung bring them all back to your memory and teach them to the little ones. Mix them all together to meet the varying moods as, in afterlife, they come over us so mysteriously. Is it not singular what trifles sometimes serve to wake the memories of youth? And what more often than snatches of olden songs not heard for many years, but which used to come from lips now closed forever? Thus the home songs not only serve to make the present home life happy and agreeable, but the very memory of it will serve as a shield of defense in times of trial and temptation. At times, amid the crushing mishaps of business, a song of the olden time breaks in upon the weary thoughts and guides the mind into another channel. Light breaks from behind the cloud in the sky, and new courage is given us. Parents do well to study the character of the younger ones. The majority of parents do not understand their children. They are kept under restraint and are not properly developed. They live a life of fear rather than of love, which should not be. Home should be the bright sanctuary of our hearts, the repository of all our thoughts. Have confidence in each other, and the seeds properly sown will spring forth with fruits that will bud and blossom, but never die. What is comparable to a well-regulated happy home? It is our heaven below, where each thought will vibrate in perfect unison. In the great majority of cases, it will be found that the frequenters of saloons and places of low resort have not pleasant homes. It should be the duty of all to strive to make homes so happy that each evening will furnish pleasant memories to lighten the load of another day. Make it so happy that you do not tire of it, but long for the hour when your day's toil is over and you desire to reach it as the happiest and dearest place on earth. Parents should more earnestly consider the importance of home culture, home happiness, home love. The latter should be the ruling element, for all the household is moved by the surrounding influences and when a spirit of love broods over the household, how kind, gentle, and considerate do all its members become. There are some persons who apparently live more for the admiration of others than for their own household, and have a smile for all but those who should be the nearest and dearest. This is almost criminally wrong. They could take no sure course to make a complete wreck of their own happiness and the home happiness. Whatever vexatious troubles parents meet in their daily life, it is their duty, no less than it should be their chief pleasure, to strive, as far as possible, to throw around the home an atmosphere of joy and happiness, to make home the dearest spot on earth, so that when, with the passage of years, the children go from thence to new and untried scenes, 
the memory of home will bring to the heart a thrill of joyful recollections and thus give them a new courage to take up the burden of life. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leilani Casper. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 11. Home Duties. And say to mothers what a holy charge is theirs, with what a kingly power their love might rule the fountains of the newborn mind. Warn them to wake at early dawn and sow good seed before the world has sown its tares. Mrs. Sigourney Duty embraces man's whole existence. It begins in the home, where there is the duty which children owe to their parents on the one hand, and the duty which parents owe their children on the other. There surely can be no more important duties to ponder over long and earnestly than those relating to the home. The duty of patience, of courtesy one to the other, the interest in each other's welfare, the duty of self-control, of learning to bear and forbear. One danger of home life springs from its familiarity. Kindred hearts at a common fireside are far too apt to relax from the proprieties of social life. Careless language and careless attire are too apt to be indulged in when the eye of the world is shut off, the ear of the world cannot hear. There should be no stiffness of family etiquette, no sternness of family discipline like that which prevailed in olden times. The day for that is past. But the day for thorough civility and courtesy among the members of a home, the day for careful propriety of dress and address, will never pass away. It is here that the truest and most faultless social life is to be lived. It is here that such a life is to be learned. A home in which true courtesy and politeness reigns is a home from which polite men and women go forth, and they go out directly from no other. It should be remembered that it is at home, in the family, and among kindred, that an everyday politeness of manner is really most to be prized. There, it confers substantial benefits and brings the sweetest returns. The little attentions which members of the same household may show towards one another day by day belong to what is styled good manners. There cannot be any ingrained gentility which does not exhibit itself first at home. Children should be trained to behave at home as you would have them behave abroad. It is the home life which they act out when away. If this is rude, gruff, and lacking in civility, they will be lacking in all that constitutes true refinement, and thus most painfully reflect on the home training when in the presence of strangers. In the actions of children, strangers can read a history of the home life. It tells of duty undone, of turmoil and strife, of fretful women and impatient men, or it speaks of a home of love and peace where patience sits enthroned in the hearts of all its members, and each is mindful of his or her duty towards the other. Let the wives and daughters of businessmen think of the toils, the anxieties, the mortification and wear that fathers undergo to secure for them comfortable homes. Is it not their duty to compensate them for these trials by making them happy at their own fireside? Happy is he who can find solace and comfort at home. And husbands, too, do not think enough of the thousand trials and petty vexatious incidents of the daily home life to which wives are subject. True, they themselves feel the harassing incidents of business, which may be of more immediate importance than the cares of home. But one large worry is preferable to many small ones. Thus, it is the duty of each to remember these facts and strive to make the home life happy by mutual self-sacrifice. Something is wrong in those homes where the little courtesies of speech are ignored in the everyday home life. When the family gather alone around the breakfast or dinner table, the same courtesy should prevail as if guests were present. Reproof, complaint, 
unpleasant discussion and sarcasm, no less than moody silence, should be banished. Let the conversation be genial and suited to the little folks as far as possible. Interesting incidents of the day's experience may be mentioned at the evening meal, thus arousing the social element. If resources fail, sometimes little extracts read from evening or morning papers will kindle the conversation. Scolding is never allowable. Reproof and criticism from parents must have their time and place, but should never intrude so far upon the social life of the family as to render the home uncomfortable. A serious word in private will generally cure a fault more easily than many public criticisms. In some families, a spirit of contradiction and discussion mars the harmony. Every statement is, as it were, dissected, and the absolute correctness of every word calculated. It interferes seriously with social freedom where unimportant social inaccuracies are watched for and exposed for the sake of exposure. Never think anything which affects the happiness of your children is too small a matter to claim your attention. Use every means in your power to win and retain their confidence. Do not rest satisfied without some account of each day's joys or sorrows. It is a source of great comfort to the innocent child to tell all its troubles to mother, and the mother should haste to lend a willing ear, soothe and quiet its little heart after the experience of the day. It has had its disappointments and trials, as well as its plays and pleasures. It is ready to throw its arms around the mother's neck, and forgetting the one live again the other. Always send the little child to bed happy. Whatever cares may trouble your mind, give the little one a good night kiss as it goes to its pillow. The memory of this in the stormy years which may be in store for it will be like Bethlehem's star to the bewildered shepherd, and the heart will receive a fresh inspiration of courage at the thrill of youthful memories. The domestic fireside is a seminary of infinite importance. It is important because it is universal and because the education it bestows, woven with the woof of childhood, gives color to the whole texture of life. Early impressions are not easily erased. The virgin wax is faithful to the signet, and subsequent impressions serve rather to indent the former one. There are but few who can receive the honors of a college education, but all are graduates of the heart. The learning of the university may fade from recollection, its classic lore may be lost from the halls of memory, but the simple lessons of home enameled upon the heart of childhood defy the rust of years and outlive the more mature but less vivid pictures of after days. So deep, so lasting are the impressions of early life that you often see a man in the imbecility of age holding fresh in his recollection the events of childhood while all the wide space between that and the present hour is a forgotten waste. Those parents act most wisely who have forethought enough to provide not only for the youth, but for the age of their offspring, who teach them usefulness, and not to expect too much from the world, to become early familiarized with the stern and actual realities of life, and never to be apes of fashion, nor parasites of greatness. Parents, then, should educate their children not merely in scholastic acquirements, but in a knowledge of the respective positions they are to occupy when they become men and women. Educate them to the duties that the world will require of them when they arrive at that long-looked-for period when they will have reached maturity and enter into the game that every person must play during his existence in the world. Educate the girl to the intricate duties that will be required of her as a wife and mother, and to the position she is to occupy in society, and that it rests with herself whether it shall be exalted or whether it shall be debased and lowly. Educate the boy to a knowledge of what the busy world will require of him. Teach him self-reliance in all manly attributes. A knowledge of the world is more than necessary to enable us to live in it wisely, and this knowledge should commence in the nursery. It must be remembered that the largest and most important part of the education of children, whether for good or evil, is carried on at home, often unconsciously in their amusements and under the daily influence of what they see and hear about them. 
it is there that subtle brains and lissom fingers find scope and learn to promote the well-being of the community one cannot tell what duties their children may be called to perform in after life they must teach them to cultivate their faculties and to exercise all their senses to choose the good and refuse the evil above all things teach children what life is it is not simply breathing and moving life is a battle and all thoughtful people see it so a battle between good and evil from childhood Good influence drawing us up toward the divine, bad influence drawing us down to the brute. Teach children that they lead two lives, the life without and the life within, that the inside must be pure in the sight of God, as well as the outside in the sight of man. Educate them, then, to love the good and true, and remember that every word spoken within the hearing of little children tends toward the formation of character. Teach little children to love the beautiful. If you are able, give them a corner in the garden for flowers. Allow them to have their favorite trees. Teach them to wander in the prettiest woodlets. Show them where they best can view the sunset. Buy them pictures and encourage them to deck their rooms in their childish way. Thus may the mother weave into the life of her children thoughts and feelings, rich, beautiful, grand, and noble which will make all after life brighter and better. The duties of children to parents are far too little considered. As the children grow up, the parents lean on them much earlier than either imagine. In the passage of years, the children gain experience and strength. But with the parents, the cares of a long life bow the form, and the strong are again made weak. It is now that the duties of children assume their grandest forms. It is not sufficient to simply give them a home to make their declining years comfortable. While supplying their physical wants, their hearts may be famishing for some expression of love from you. If you think they have outgrown these desires, you are mistaken. Every little attention you can show your mother, your escort to church or concert, or for a quiet walk, brings back the youth of her heart. Her cheeks glow with pleasure, and she feels happy for such a dutiful son. The father, occupied and absorbed as he may be, is not wholly indifferent to the filial expressions of devoted love. He may pretend to care but very little for them, but, having faith in their sincerity, it would give him pain were they entirely withheld. Fathers need their sons quite as much as the sons need the fathers. But in how many deplorable instances do they fail to find in them a staff for their declining years? You may disappoint the ambition of your parents. You may be unable to distinguish yourself as you fondly hoped. But let this not swerve you from a determination to be a son of whose moral character they need never be ashamed. Begin early to cultivate a habit of thoughtfulness and consideration for others, especially for those you are commanded to honor. Can you begrudge a few extra steps for the mother who never stopped to number those you demanded during your helpless infancy? Have you the heart to slight her requests or treat her remarks with indifference, when you cannot begin to measure the patient devotion with which she bore your peculiarities? Anticipate her wants. Invite her confidence. Be prompt to offer assistance. Express your affections as heartily as you did when a child that the mother may never have occasion to grieve in secret for the child she has lost. End of Home Duties Recording by Leilani Casper Section number 12 of The Golden Gems of Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hello, I'm Andy Crunch. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section number 12, Aim of Life. It is the aim that makes the man, and without this he is nothing, as far as the utter destitution of force, weight, and even individuality among men 
can reduce him to non-entity. The strong gusts and currents of the world sweep him this way and that, without steam or sail to impel or helm to guide him. If he be not speedily wrecked or run aground, it is more his good fortune than good management. We have never heard a more touching confession of utter weakness and misery than these words from one singularly blessed with the endowments of nature and of providence. My life is aimless. Take heed, young man, of an aimless life. Take heed, too, of a low and sordid aim. A well-ascertained and generous purpose gives vigour, direction and perseverance to all man's efforts. Its concomitants are a well-disciplined intellect, character, influence, tranquillity and cheerfulness within, success and honour without. Whatever a man's talents and advantages may be, with no aim or a low one, he is weak and despicable and he cannot be otherwise than respectable and influential with a high one. Without some definite object before us, some standard which we are earnestly striving to reach, we cannot expect to obtain to any great height, either mentally or morally. Placing for ourselves high standards, and wishing to reach them without any further effort on our part, is not enough to elevate us in, in any very great degree. Someone has said, Nature holds for each of us all that we need to make us useful and happy, but she requires us to labour for all that we get. God gives nothing of value unto man unmatched by need of labour, and we can expect to overcome difficulties only by strong and determined efforts. Here is a great and noble work lying just before us, just as the blue ocean lies out beyond the rocks which line the shore. In our strivings for something better than we have known, we should work for others' good rather than our own pleasure. Those whose object in life is their own happiness find at last that their lives are sad failures. We need to do something each day that shall help us to a larger life of soul, and every word or deed which brings joy or gladness to other hearts lifts us nearer a perfect life for a noble deed is a step towards God. To live for something worthy of life involves the necessity of an intelligent and definite plan of action. More than splendid dreamings or magnificent resolves is necessary to success in the objects and ambitions of life. Men come to the best results in every department of effort only as they thoughtfully plan and earnestly toil in given directions. Purposes without work is dead. It were vain to hope for good results from mere plans. Random or spasmodic efforts, like aimless shoots, are generally no better than wasted time or strength. The purposes of shrewd men in the business of this life are always followed by careful plans, enforced by work. Whether the object is learning, honour or wealth, the ways and means are always laid out according to the best rules and methods. The mariner has his chart, the architect his plans, the sculptor his model, and all as a means and condition of success. Inventive genius, or even what is called inspiration, can do little in any department of the theoretic or practical science except as it works by a well-formed plan. Then every step is an advance towards the accomplishment of its object. Every tack of the ship made in accordance with nautical law keeps her steadily nearing the port. Each stroke of the chisel brings the marble into a clearer likeness to the model. No effort or time is lost, for nothing is done rashly or at random. Thus, in the grand aim of life, if some worthy purpose be kept constantly in view, and for its accomplishment every effort be made every day of your life, you will unconsciously, perhaps, approach the goal of your ambition. There can be no question among the philosophic observers of men and events that fixedness of purpose is a grand element of human success. When a man has formed a great sovereign purpose, it governs his conduct, as the laws of nature govern the operation of physical things.
everyone should have a mark in view and pursue it steadily. He should not be turned from his course by other objects ever so attractive. Life is not long enough for any one man to accomplish everything. Indeed, but few can at best accomplish more than one thing well. Many, alas, very many, accomplish nothing. Yet there is not a man endowed with ordinary intellect or accomplishments, but can accomplish at least one useful, important, worthy purpose. It was not without reason that some of the greatest men were trained from their youth to choose some definite object in life to which they were required to direct their thoughts and to devote all their energies. It became, therefore, a sole and ruling purpose of their hearts and was almost certainly the means of their future advancement and happiness in the world. Of the thousands of men who are annually coming upon the stage of life, there are few who escape the necessity of adopting some profession or calling, and there are fewer still who, if they knew the miseries of idleness, tenfold keener and more numerous than those of the most laborious profession, would ever desire such an escape. First of all, a choice of business or occupation should be made, and made early, with uh, wise reference to capacity and taste. The youth should be educated for it and, as far as possible, in it. And when this is done, it should be pursued with industry, energy and enthusiasm, which will warrant success. This choice of an occupation depends partly upon the individual preference and partly upon circumstances. It may be that you are debarred from entering upon that business for which you are best adapted. In that case, make the best choice in your power Apply yourself faithfully and earnestly to whatever you undertake, and you cannot well help achieving a success. Patient application sometimes leads to great results. No man should be discouraged because he does not get on rapidly in his calling from the start. In the more intellectual professions, especially it should be remembered that a solid character is not the growth of a day, that the mental faculties are not matured except by long and laborious culture to refine the taste, to fortify the reasoning faculty with its appropriate discipline, to store the cells of memory with varied and useful learning, to train all the powers of the mind systematically is the work of calm and studious years. A young man's education has been of but little use to him if it has not taught him to check the fretful impatience, the eager haste to drink the cup of life, the desire to exhaust the intoxicating draught of ambition. He should set his aim so high that it will require patient years of toil to reach it. If he can reach it at a bound, it is unworthy of him. It should be of such a nature that he feels the necessity of husbanding his resources. You will receive all sorts of the most excellent advice, but you must do your own deciding. You have to take care of yourself in this world, and you may as well take your own way of doing it. But if a change of business is desired, be sure the fault is with the business and not with the individual. For running hither and thither generally makes sorry work, and brings to poverty ere the sands of life are half run. The north, south, east and west furnish vast fields for enterprise. But of what avail for the seeker to visit the four corners of the world if he is still dissatisfied and returns home with empty pockets and idle hands, thinking that the world is wrong and that he himself is a misused and shamefully imposed on creature. The world, smiling at the rebuff, moves on while he lags behind, groaning over misusage without sufficient energy to roll his up his sleeves and fight his way through. A second profession seldom succeeds, not because a man may not make himself fully equal to its duties, but because the world will not readily believe he is so. The world argues thus, he that has failed in his first profession, to which he dedicated the morning of his life and the springtime of his excursion, is not the most likely person to master a second. To this it might be replied that a man's first profession is often chosen for him by others. His second he usually decides upon for himself. Therefore, his failure in his first profession may, for what he knows, be mainly owing to the sincere but mistaken attention he was constantly paying to his second. 
ever remember that it is not your trade or profession that makes you respectable. Manhood and profession or handicraft are entirely different things. An occupation is never an end of life. It is an instrument put into our hands by which to gain for the body the means of living until sickness or old age robs it of life. And we pass on to the world for which this is preparation. The great purpose of living is twofold in character. The one should never change from the time reason takes a helm. It is to live a life of manliness, of purity and honour. To live such a life that, whether rich or poor, your neighbours will honour and respect you as a man of sterling principles. The other is to have some business, in the due performance of which you are put forth all of your exertions. It matters not so much what it is as whether it be honourable and it may change to suit the varying change of circumstances. When these two objects, character and a high aim, are fairly before a youth, what then? He must strive to obtain those objects. He must work as well as dream, labour as well as pray. His hand must be as stout as his heart, his arm as strong as his head. Purpose must be followed by action. Then he is living and acting worthily, as becomes a human being with great destinies in store for him. And that is the end of section 12. Recording completed and performed by Andy Crunch. Section 13 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Nickerson The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson Section 13 Success or Failure Mankind everywhere are desirous of achieving a success, of making the most of life. At times, it is true, they act as if they little cared what was the outcome of their exertions. But even in the lives of the most abandoned and reckless, there are moments when their good angel points out to them the heights to which they might ascend, that a wish arises for something better than they have known. But alas, they have not the will to make the necessary exertions. We are confronted with two ends, success or failure. To win the former it requires of us labor and perseverance. We must remember that those who start for glory must imitate the meddled hounds of Acton, and must pursue the game not only where there is a path, but where there is none. They must be able to simulate and to dissimulate, to leap and to creep, to conquer the earth like Caesar, to fall down and kiss it like Brutus to throw their sword like Brennus into the trembling scale, or like Nelson, to snatch the laurels from the doubtful hand of victory while she is hesitating where to bestow them. He that would win success in life must make perseverance his bosom friend, experience his wise counselor, caution his elder brother, and hope his guardian genius. He must not repine because the fates are sometimes against him, but when he trips or falls, let him, like Caesar when he stumbled on shore, stumble forward, and, by escaping the omen, change its nature and meaning. Remembering that those very circumstances which are apt to be abused as the palliatives of failure are the true tests of merit, let him gird up his loins for whatever in the mysterious economy of the future may await him. Thus he will rise superior to ill fortune and becoming daily more and more impassive to its attacks, will learn to force his way in spite of it, till, at last, he will be able to fashion his luck to his will. Life is too short, says a shrewd thinker, for us to waste one moment in deploring our lot. We must go after success, since it will not come to us, and we have no time to spare. If you wish to succeed, you must do as you would to get in through a crowd to a gate all are anxious to reach. Hold your ground and push hard. To stand still is to give up the battle. 
Give your energies to the highest employment of which your nature is capable. Be alive, be patient, work hard, watch opportunities, be rigidly honest, hope for the best, and if you are not able to reach the goal of your ambition, which is possible in spite of your utmost efforts, you will die with the consciousness of having done your best, which is, after all, the truest success to which man can aspire. As manhood dawns and the young man catches its first lights, the pinnacles of realized dreams, the golden domes of high possibilities, and the purpling hills of great delights, and then looks down upon the narrow, sinuous, long, and dusty paths by which others have reached them, he is apt to be disgusted with the passage, and to seek for success through broader channels and by quicker means. To begin at the foot of the hills and work slowly to the top seems a very discouraging process, and here it is that thousands of young men have made shipwreck of their lives. There is no royal road to success. The path lies through troubles and discouragements. It lies through fields of earnest, patient labor. It calls on the young man to put forth energy and determination. It bids him build well his foundation. But it promises in reward of this a crowning triumph. There never was a time in the world's history when high success in any profession or calling demanded harder or more earnest labor than now. It is impossible to succeed in a hurry. Men can no longer go at a single leap into eminent positions, as those articles are most highly prized to attain which requires the greatest amount of labor, so the road that leads to success is long and rugged. What matter if a round does break or a foot slip? Such things must be expected, and being expected they must be overcome. Rome was not built in a day, but proofs of her magnificent temples are still to be seen. We each prepare a temple to last through all eternity, a structure to last so long. Can it take but a day to build it? The days of a lifetime are necessary to build the monument mightier than Rome and more enduring than adamant. It is hard, earnest work, step by step, that secures success and while energy and perseverance are securing the prize for steady workers, others, sitting down by the wayside, are wondering why they, too, cannot be successful. They surely forget that the true key is labor, and that nothing but a strong, resolute will can turn it. The secret of one's success or failure is usually contained in answer to the question, How earnest is he? Success is the child of confidence and perseverance. The talent of success is simply doing what you can do well, and doing well whatever you do, without a thought of fame. Success is the best test of capacity, and materially confirms us in a favorable opinion of ourselves. Success in life is the proper and harmonious development of those faculties which God has given us. Whatever you try to do in life, Try with all your heart to do it well. Whatever you devote yourself to, devote yourself to it completely. Never believe it possible that any natural ability can claim immunity from companionship of the steady, plain, hard-working qualities and hope to gain its end. There can be no such fulfillment on this earth. Some happy talent and some fortunate opportunity may form the sides of the ladder on which some men mount, but the rounds of the ladder must be made of material to stand wear and tear, and there is no substitute for thoroughgoing, ardent, sincere earnestness. Never put your hand on anything into which you cannot throw your whole self. Never affect depreciation of your own work, whatever it is. Although success is the garden for which all men toil, they have, nevertheless, often to labor on perseveringly without any glimmer of success in sight. They have to live, meanwhile, upon their courage, sowing their seed, it may be in the dark, in the hope that it will yet take root and spring up an achieved result. The best of causes have had to fight their way to triumph through a long succession of failures, 
and many of the assailants have died in the breach before the fortune has been won. The heroism they have displayed is to be measured not so much by their immediate successes as by the opposition they have encountered and the courage with which they have maintained the struggle. Among the habits required for the efficient prosecution of business of any kind and consequent success, the most important are those of application, observation, method, accuracy, punctuality, and dispatch. Some persons sneer at these virtues as little things, trifles unworthy of their notice. It must be remembered that human life is made up of trifles. As the pence make the pound and the minutes the hour, so it is the repetition of little things, severally insignificant, that make up human character. In the majority of cases where men have failed of success, it has been owing to the neglect of little things deemed too microscopic to need attention. It is the result of practical, everyday experience that steady attention to matter of detail is the mother of good fortune. Accuracy is also of much importance and an invariable mark of good training in a man. Accuracy in observation, accuracy in speech, accuracy in the transaction of affairs. What is done in business must be done well if you would win the success desired. Give a man power and a field in which to use it, and he must accomplish something. He may not do and become all that he desires and dreams of, but his life cannot well be a failure. God has given to all of us ability and opportunity enough to be moderately successful. If we utterly fail in the majority of cases, it is our own fault. We have either neglected to improve the talents with which our Creator has endowed us, or we fail to enter the door that has opened for us. Such is the constitution of human society that the wise person gradually learns not to expect too much from life. While he strives for success by worthy methods, he will be prepared for failure. He will keep his mind open to enjoyment, but submit patiently to suffering. Wailings and complainings in life are never of any use. Only cheerful and continuous working in right paths are of real avail. In spite of our best efforts, failures are in store for many of us. It remains, then, for you to do the best you can under all circumstances, remembering that the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong. It is by the right application of swiftness and strength that you are to make your way. It is not sufficient to do the right thing. It must be done in the right way, at the right time, if you would achieve success. Young man, have you ever considered long and earnestly what you were best capable of doing in the world? If not, put it off no longer. You expect to do something. You wish to achieve success. Have you ever thought of what success consisted? It does not consist in amassing a fortune. Some of the most unsuccessful men have done that. Remember, too, that success and fame are not synonymous terms. You cannot all be famous as lawyers, statesmen, or divines. You may or may not accumulate a fortune. But is it not true that wealth, position, and fame are but the accidents of success, that success may or may not be accompanied by them, that it is something above and beyond them? In this sense of the word, you only are to blame if you fall. It is in your power to live a life of integrity and honor, you can so live that all will honor and respect you. You can speak words of cheer to the downhearted, a kindly word of caution to the erring one. You can help remove some obstacle from the paths of the weak. You can incite in the minds of those around you a desire to live a pure, straightforward life. You can bid those who are almost overwhelmed by the billows and waves of sorrow to look up and see the sun shining through the rifts in the dark clouds passing o'er them. All this you can do, and a grand success will be your reward. Away, then, with your lethargy. You are a man. Arise in your strength and your manhood. Resolve to be in this, its true sense, a successful man. And then, if wealth or fame wait on you, and men delight to do your honor, these will be but added laurels to your brow but the gilded frame encasing success.
End of section 13. Section 14 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Drexler. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen in S.C. Ferguson. Section 14. Dignity of Labor. Dignity of Labor. Labor, either of the head or the hand, is the lot of humanity. There are no exceptions to this general rule. The rich who have toiled early and late for a competence find their present ease more unendurable than their past exertions, and the round of pleasures to which, in other days, they looked for a reward of their toil and actual realization resolve themselves into drudgeries, often worse than those from which they vainly fancied they had escaped. The king on his throne is beset with cares, and the labor he performs is oft times far heavier than any borne by the poorest peasant in his dominions. The high and low alike acknowledge the universal sway of labor, that which is thus the common lot of mankind and reigns with such universal sway cannot be otherwise than honorable in the highest degree. Labor may be a burden and a chastisement but it is also an honor and a glory. Without it, nothing can be accomplished. All that to man is great and precious is acquired only through labor. Without it, civilization would relapse into barbarism. It is the forerunner and indispensable requisite to all the sweet influence of refinement. It is the herald of happiness and makes the desert to blossom as a garden of roses. It whitens the sea with sails and stretches bands of iron across the continent. It is labor that drives the plow, scatters the seed, and causes the fields to wave in golden harvests for the good of man. It gathers the grain and sends it to different regions of the earth to feed other millions toiling in less favored channels there. Labor gathers the gossamer web of the caterpillar, the cotton from the field and the fleece from the flock, and weaves them into raiment soft, warm, and beautiful. The purple robe of royalty, the plain man's sober suit, the fantastic dress of the painted savage, and the furry coverings of arctic lands are alike the results of its handiwork and proofs of its universal sway and honor. Labor molds the brick, splits the slate, and quarries the stone. It shapes the column and rears not only the humble cottage, but the gorgeous palace, the tapering spire, and stately dome. It is by labor that mankind have risen from a state of barbarism to the light of the present. It is only by labor that progression can continue. Labor, possessing such inherent dignity, and being the grand measure of progress, it is the most fitting that man should not taste life's greatest happiness, or wield great influence for good, or reach the summit of his ambitious resolves, save only as the result of long and patient labor. Life is a short day, but it is a working day and not a holiday. Man was made for action, and life is a mere scene for the exercise of the mind and engagement of the hand, a scene where the most important occupations are, in one sense, but species of amusement, and where so long as we take pleasure in the pursuit of an object it matters but little, that we secure it or not, or that it fades when acquired. Life to some is drudgery, to some pain, to some art, to others pleasure, but to all work. Let none feel a sense of sore disappointment that life to them becomes routine. It is a necessary consequence of our natures that our work and our amusements, our businesses and our pleasures should tend to become routine. The same wants, the same demands, and similar duties meet us on the threshold of every day. We look forward to some great occasion on which to display ourselves, some grand event in which to give proof of a heroic spirit, and complain of the petty routine of daily life. On the contrary, it is this succession of little duties, little works apparently of no account, which constitute the grand work of life. And we display true nobility when we cheerfully take these up and go forward content to labor and to wait. Alas for the man or woman who has not learned to work, 
They are but poor creatures. They know not themselves. They depend on others for support. Let them not fancy they have a monopoly of enjoyment. They have missed the sweetest pleasure of life, even the pleasure of self-reliant feeling, born of vanquished difficulties. They know not the thrill of pleasure experienced by him who carries difficult projects to a successful termination. Each rest owes its deliciousness to toil, and no toil is so burdensome as the rest of him who has nothing to task and quicken his powers. They do not realize in their blind pride what labor has done for them. It was labor that rocked them in their cradle and nourished their pampered life. Without it, the very garments on their back would be unspun. He is indebted to toil for the meanest thing that ministers to his wants, save only the air of heaven, and even that, in God's wise providence, is breathed with labor. Labor explores the rich veins of deeply buried rocks, extracting the gold and silver, the copper and tin. Labor smelts the iron and molds it into a thousand shapes for use and ornaments from the massive pillar to the tiniest needle, from the ponderous anchor to the wire gauze, from the mighty flywheel of the engine to the polished purse ring or glittering bead. Labor hews down the gnarled oak, shapes the timbers, builds the ship, and guides it over the deep, bringing to our shores the produce of every clime. But mere physical manual labor is not the sole end of life. It must be joined with higher means of improvement, or it degrades instead of exalts. The poorest laborer has intellect, heart, imagination, tastes, as well as bones and muscles, and he is grievously wronged when compelled to exclusive drudgery for bodily subsistence. It is the condition of all outward comforts and improvements, whilst at the same time it conspires with higher means and influences in ministering to the vigor and growth of the mind. Not only has labor inherent dignity, but it is almost a necessity for mind as well as body. Man is an intelligence, sustained and preserved by bodily organs, and their active exercise is necessary to the enjoyment of health. It is not work, but overwork, that is hurtful. It is not hard work that is injurious so much as monotonous, fagging, hopeless work. All hopeful work is healthful and to be usefully and properly employed is one of the great secrets of happiness. Most interesting is the contemplation of the victories achieved by the hand of labor, victories far grander than any achieved by physical force on the field of battle. For as conquests are wrested from nature, the very elements are brought under subjection and made to contribute to the good of man. It displays its triumph in a thousand cities, its glories in shapes of beauty, it speaks in words of power. It makes the sinewy arm strong with liberty. The poor man's heart, rich with content, crowns the swarthy and sweaty brow with honor, dignity, and peace. It is one of the best regulators of practical character. It evokes and disciplines obedience, self-control, attention, application, and perseverance, giving a man deftness and skill in his physical calling and aptitude and dexterity in the affairs of ordinary life. Work is the law of our being, the living principle that carries men and nations onward. Manual labor is a school in which men are placed to get energy of purpose and character, a vastly more important endowment than the learning of other schools. The laborer is placed indeed under hard masters, the power of physical elements, physical sufferings, and want. But these stern teachers do a work which no compassionate, intelligent friend could do for us, and true wisdom will bless providence for this sharp necessity. Labor is not merely the grand instrument by which the earth is overspread with fruitfulness and beauty, the ocean subdued and matter wrought into innumerable forms for comfort and ornament. It has a far higher function, which is to give force to the will, efficiency, courage, the capacity of endurance and of devotion to far-reaching plans. We must ever remember that it is the intention only that disgraces, that all honest work is honorable, and if your occupation be not so high-sounding as you would like, still it is better to work faithfully at this until opportunity opens the door to something higher. Because you do not find just what suits you, 
to refuse to labor at all, to play the drone, is to act unworthy of yourself and your destiny. Neither is it beneath you to make yourself useful, regardless of what your position and wealth may be. A gentleman by birth and education, however richly he may be endowed with worldly position, cannot but feel that he is in duty bound to contribute his quota of endeavor towards the general well-being in which he shares. He cannot be satisfied with being fed, clad, and maintained by the labors of others without making some suitable return to the society that upholds him. It matters not what a person's natural gifts may be, he cannot expect to attain in any profession to a high degree of success without going through with a vast deal of work which taken by itself would rightly be called drudgery. That quality in man which, for want of a better name we call genius, does not consist in an ability to get along without work, but on the contrary is generally the faculty of doing an immense amount of work. Young men sometimes think that it is not respectable to be at work, and imagine that there is some character of disgrace or degradation belonging to toil. No greater mistake could be made. Instead of being disgraceful to engage in work, it is especially honorable. The most illustrious names in history were hard workers. No one whom posterity delights to honor ever dreamed or idled his way to fame. To be idle and useless is neither an honor nor a privilege. Though persons of small natures may be content merely to consume, men of average endowments, of manly expectations, and of honest purpose will feel such a condition to be incompatible with real honor and true dignity. The noblest man on earth is he who puts his hands cheerfully and proudly to honest labor and goes forth to conquer honor and worth. Labor is mighty and beautiful. The world has long since learned that man cannot be truly man without employment. Would that young men might judge of the dignity of labor by its usefulness rather than by the gloss it wears. We do not see a man's nobility in dress and toilet adornments, but in the sinewy arm, roughened as it may be by hardy, honest toil, under whose farmer's or mechanic's vest a kingly heart may beat. Exalt thine adopted calling or profession, look on labor as honorable, and dignify the task before thee, whether it be in the study, office, counting room, workshop, or furrowed field. There is equality in all, and the resolute will and pure heart may ennoble either. End of section 14 Section 15 of The Golden Gems of Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Raj The Golden Gems of Life by Emory Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson Section number 15 Perseverance It is only by reflection that we derive a just appreciation of the value of perseverance. When we see how much can be accomplished, in any given direction by the man or woman of but average ability who resolutely perseveres in the course of action adopted as the ruling purpose of their lives, we then arrive at a just estimate of the value of perseverance as a factor in success. The old fable of the hare and the tortoise only exemplifies a truth which we are all ready to admit when we once stop to admire those stupendous works of nature and art which proclaim in no uncertain tones the triumph of perseverance all the performances of human art at which we look with praise or wonder are instances of the resistless force of perseverance it is by this that the quarry becomes a pyramid, it is by this the Coliseum of Rome was built, and this it was that enclosed in adamant the Chinese Empire. One man's individual exertion seems to go for nothing. 
if a person were to compare the result of one man's work with the general design and last result he would be overwhelmed by the sense of their disproportion yet these petty operations incessantly continued in time surmount the greatest difficulties mountains are elevated and oceans bounded by the slender force of human beings how many men who have won well nigh imperishable renown in the world of literature science or art owe all their greatness to persevering efforts how many of those whom the world calls geniuses can exclaim with newton that they owe all their greatness to persevering efforts and whatever they may have been able to accomplish more than ordinary has been solely by virtue of perseverance they were the sons of unremitting industry and toil they were once as weak and helpless as any of us once as destitute of wisdom and power as an infant once the very alphabet of that language which they have wielded with such magic effect was unknown to them they toil long to learn it to get its sounds understand its deeper fancies and longer still to obtain the secret of its highest charm and mightiest power and yet even longer for those living glorious thoughts which they bade it bear to an astonished and admiring world their characters which are now given to the world and will be to millions yet unborn as patterns of greatness and goodness were made by that untiring perseverance which marked their whole lives from childhood to age they knew no such word as fail defeat only gave them power difficulty only taught them the necessity of redoubled exertions dangers gave them courage and the sight of great labors inspired in them corresponding exertions their success has been wrought out by persevering industry it has been said by shrewd observers that successful men owe more to their perseverance than to their natural powers their friends or the favorable circumstances around them genius will falter by the side of labor great powers will give place to great industry talents are desirable but perseverance is more so it will make mental powers or at least strengthen those already made this should teach a great lesson of patience to those who are so nearly ready to sink in despair and have grown weary in their strivings for better things for one who faints not but resolutely takes up the work of life and perseveringly continues his exertion it is possible for him to reach almost any height to which his ambition may point some of the great works of literature in which are stored away great masses of information are the results of persevering efforts before which many minds would have quailed gibbon consumed 19 years in writing his masterpiece how many would have had the courage to persevere that length of time though certain of success at last courage when combined with energy and perseverance will overcome difficulties apparently insurmountable perseverance working in the right direction and when steadily practiced even by the most humble will rarely fail of its reward it inspires in the minds of all fair minded people a friendly feeling who will not befriend the persevering energetic youth the fearless man of industry who is not a friend to him who is a friend to himself he who perseveres in business amidst hardships and discouragements will always find ready and generous friends in time of need he who will persevere in a course of wisdom 
rectitude and benevolence is sure to gather round him friends who will be true and faithful go to the men of business of work of influence and ask them who shall have their confidence and support they'll tell you the men who falter not by the wayside who toil on in their calling against every barrier whose eyes are upward and whose motto is excelsior these are the men to whom they give their confidence but they shun the lazy the indolent the fearful and faltering they would as soon trust the wind as such men if you would win friends be steady and true to yourself be the unfailing friend of your own purposes stand by your own character and others will come to your aid almost every portion of the earth teems with works which show what man has been able to effect in the physical world by means of perseverance calculate if you can the efforts required to build the pyramids of egypt can you conceive of a more enduring monument to the triumph of perseverance than that look at nature she has a thousand voices teaching lessons of perseverance the lofty mountains are wearing down by slow degrees the ocean is gradually but surely filling up by deposits from its thousand rivers and by the labors of a little insect so small as to be almost invisible to the naked eye every shower that sweeps over the surface of the country tends to bring the hills and the mountains to the level of the plains nature has but one lesson on this subject and that is persevere more depends upon active perseverance than upon genius says a common sense author upon this subject genius unexerted is no more genius than a bushel of acorns is a forest of oaks there may be epics in men's brains just as there are oaks in acorns but the tree and the book must come out before we can measure them firmness of purpose is one of the most necessary sinews of character and one of the best instruments of success without it genius wastes its efforts in a maze of inconsistencies it gives power to weakness and opens to poverty the world's mark it spreads fertility over the barren landscape and bids the choicest fruits and flowers spring up and flourish in the desert abode there is perhaps nothing more conducive to success in any important and difficult undertaking than a firm steady unremitting spirit in seasons of distress and difficulty to abandon ourselves to dejection is evidence of a weak mind opposing circumstances often create strength both mental and physical opposition gives us greater power of resistance to overcome one barrier gives us greater ability to overcome the next it is cowardice to grumble about circumstances instead of sinking under trouble it becomes us in the evil day with perseverance to maintain our part to bear up against the storm to have recourse to those advantages which in the worst of times are always left to integrity and virtue and never to give up the hope that better days may come it is wonderful to see what miracles a resolute and unyielding will can achieve before its irresistible energy the most formidable obstacles become as cobweb barriers in the path difficulties the terrors of which cause the irresolute to sink back with dismay provoke from the man of lofty determination only a smile the whole history of our race all nature indeed teems with examples to show what wonders may be accomplished by resolute perseverance and patient toil 
how many there are who thinking of the immense amount of work lying between them and the object of their desires are almost ready to give up in despair but do they not when they view the work thus in mass forget that there is time enough if only rightly improved to suffice for each effort one step after another perseveringly continued will enable you to arrive at your journey's end however long it may be it is only when you come to reckon up the aggregate number of steps that you are ready to sink under a feeling of despair but you are not required to take them all at once there is an allotted time for each individual step thus in viewing any work that you may have marked out in life only remember that you are not obliged to do the work all at once that the regular daily portions performed quietly and systematically day after day will enable you to achieve almost any desired result when we reflect on the wonderful results that perseverance has accomplished we are led to believe that the man who wills resolves and perseveres can do almost anything everyone then regardless of his condition in life should set his aim high and resolve to remit no labor necessary for its realization but cheerfully take up the trials and burdens that life has in store for him and carry them forward be the discouragements what they may to a glorious consummation only learn to carry a thing through in all of its details and you have measured the secret of success only learn to persevere in carrying out any plan of work which an enlightened judgment decides is the best and you will force life to yield you its grandest triumphs there is almost no limit to what you can achieve if you thus govern your actions and make all your exertions contribute to the fulfilling of some great purpose of life which you took up with a brave heart and with a determination to persevere therein until success crowns your efforts the end of Section number 15, Perseverance, recording by Raj. Section 16 of the Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ron Broach. The Golden Gems of Life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section sixteen enterprise closely allied with the qualities of self-reliance and energy is that characteristic quality which so much conduces to success in life and is generally expressed by the word enterprise it is distinct from energy inasmuch as it is constantly active in discovering new fields for energy to exert itself in we are familiar with examples of men who have won fortunes or gained renown, not because they pursued better or wiser courses, but because of some originality in their aims and methods by which they were enabled to command the attention of the busy world long enough to wrest from it the special object of their choice. True enterprise is constantly on the alert to discover some new want of society, some fertile source of profit or honor some unexplored field of business and is ready to supply the one or to take advantage of the other it is nearly an indispensable element in these days of fierce competition every avenue of business is crowded and as soon as it is known that one party has made a success by one method there are scores of eager aspirants ready to try the successful plan so that straight away it too ceases to be unique and in becoming common loses the power it formerly possessed of compelling success hence the latecomers in the field are doomed to failure while they may at the same time be better fitted for the peculiar work in hand what they should do is aim at success by new plans and methods 
everyone knows the enthusiastic glow that animates the whole being of him who feels the ardor of an explorer who surmounts difficulties by and before unthought of expedients who plans and projects enterprises that had previously escaped the active minds of his fellow men it is by virtue of this very enthusiasm that the man of enterprise who is so ready to adopt new measures plans and projects is enabled to carry into his business or profession an energy and inspiration which is totally lacking on the part of those who are followers hence the latter oft-times fail of success which their talents might almost be said to have promised them therefore those who enter the list to win life's battles must expect if they would reach their goal to wage the fight not only by the old methods but by the new to use only those tactics which are sanctioned by usage is to invite defeat throw open the windows of your mind to new ideas and keep at least abreast of the times and if possible ahead of them nothing is more fatal to self-advancement than a stupid conservatism or a servile imitation the days when a man could get rich by plodding on without enterprise and without taxing his brain have gone by mere industry and economy are not enough there must be intelligence and original thought whatever your calling inventiveness adaptability promptness of decision must direct and utilize your force and if you do not find markets you must make them in business you need not know many books but you must know your trade and men you may be slow at logic but you must dart at chances you may stick to your groove in politics but in your business you must switch into new tracks and shape yourself to every exigency we emphasize this matter because in no country is the red tapist out of place as here every calling is filled with bold keen subtle-witted men fertile in expedients and devices who are perpetually inventing new ways of buying cheaply underselling or attracting custom and the man who sticks doggedly to the old-fashioned methods who runs in a perpetual rut will find himself outstripped in the race of life if he is not stranded on the sands of popular indifference keep then your eyes open and your wits about you and you may distance all competitors but if you ignore all new methods you will find yourself like a lugger contending with an ocean steamer it is enterprise that oils the wheels of energy and industry industry gathers together with a frugal hand the means whereby we are enabled to develop our plans and purposes energy gives us force whereby we gather the courage to preserve in the lines decided on bids us to put on a bold mien and go forth to do valiant battle against opposing circumstances but it is enterprise that suggests ways and means to overcome difficulties that threaten to overwhelm us it is enterprise that bids us explore entirely new fields discovering expedients that will enable us to change what by the force of circumstances was fast becoming failure into a glorious victory bringing us to wealth position and fame it is to enterprise that we are indebted for those rich discoveries in scientific fields by which we decipher the records of past ages and unravel the secrets which nature surrounded with mystery compelling them to serve us it was enterprise that harnessed steam teaching it to do our bidding and brought the lightning down from the heavens to carry our thoughts to the uttermost parts of the earth it is the spirit of enterprise driving curious minds to work in new directions that has given us all those useful and curious inventions which have done so much to make this nineteenth century civilization to shine with so lustrous a light in short it is enterprise that lifts the man of but mediocre abilities and attainments into the foremost ranks of the successful ones enterprise is an inheritance and not an acquisition but it can at the same time be improved by cultivation the same as bodily strength or any mental faculty he who would excel as a swimmer must often be in the water and the gymnast does not spare himself long and fatiguing exertions so of an enterprising spirit some men seem born with an overflow of this while others possess it in a slight degree only 
but if any would be known as enterprising men, they must not hesitate to show by their everyday actions that they rely upon themselves in cases of emergency, and the greater the necessity, the better means of surmounting it are constantly discovered. They must not hesitate to try plans because they are new, but if sober judgment can discover no objection to it, they must seize upon the very novelty of the plan as an inducement, and be only the more eager to put it to the test. There is no life so routine but that it constantly affords scope for the exercise of enterprising energy. The very fact that you are finding it routine and commonplace should at once set you to work to devise some new way to change this. Do not stand sighing, wishing, and waiting, but go to work with an energy and perseverance that will set every obstacle in the way of your success flying like leaves before a whirlwind. A weak and irresolute way of doing business will shipwreck your plans as readily as effects follow causes. You may have ambition enough to wish yourself on the topmost round of the ladder of success, but if you have not the requisite energy to commence and enterprise enough to push ahead even when you know you are off the beaten track, you will always remain at the bottom, or at least on the lower rounds. Providence has hidden a charm in difficult undertakings which is appreciated only by those who dare to grapple with them. But this can only be true when you, by your own exertions and the strength of your own self-reliance and enterprise, have achieved the results. Nothing can be more distasteful than to see men of apparently good abilities waiting for someone to come and help them over difficulties. Be your own helper. If a rock rises up before you, roll it along or climb over it. If you want money, earn it. If you want confidence, prove yourself worthy of it. Do not be content with doing what has been done. Surpass it. Deserve success and it will come. The sun does not rise like a rocket or go down like a bullet fired from a gun. Slowly and surely it makes its rounds and never tires. It is as easy to be a lead horse as a wheel horse. If the job be long, the pay will be greater. If the task be hard, the more competent you must be to do it. We must apportion our strength and exertions to the requisite tasks and duties. He who weakly shrinks from the struggle, who will offer no resistance, who will endure no labor or fatigue, can neither fulfill his own vocation nor contribute aught to the general welfare of mankind. The spirit of the times demands that all who would rise in life shrink not back from labor, but also demands that they exert themselves understandingly, that they spare no effort to master all the intricacies of the business or vocation in which they are engaged, that they be alert to discover new ways by which they may reach the desired goal easier than the old, that they bear in mind that sticking to the old ruts is only the right policy so long as no better way presents itself, and when that way is discovered, be not at all slow to improve it. If you do not, others more enterprising will rush forward to reap the profits it promises, and you will be left behind in the race. No matter what your position in life may be, or the conditions which him you in, there will be a tide in your affairs, which taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. But you must be ready to accept the chance. While you are hesitating and deliberating, the occasion goes by, and in most cases never to return again. Therefore be prompt to seize it as it flies. Cultivate as far as possible the spirit of enterprise, for on that, in a great degree, depends your success or failure. End of section 16. Recording by Ron Broach.